My dad ducked his head, sipped his drink, and said into the knot of his tie, Men are going to look at you. This wasn't news to me, and hadn't been for a while. It's not your fault, Julia, said my father, pulling off his glasses as he spoke. It's what men do. It's how we're wired. Maybe men and women. We're programmed to notice each other. I'd flicked my ponytail over my shoulder. I was already five foot four inches of the eventual five foot nine I'd reach. My hair was thick and butterscotch blonde, and that fall I'd graduated from a training bra to an actual B cup and started junior high. These events combined made me feel as if my body wasn't really me anymore, but something I lived inside, a borrowed blouse I'd snuck out of my mother's closet. Something I needed to treat carefully and could, if I was lucky, one day return. Men will look, my dad had said, watching me with a mixture of love and regret. Sometimes he'd quote a line of Yeats about how only God, my dear, could love you for yourself and not your golden hair. It made me feel strange, a little proud, a little ashamed, especially because the truth, which maybe he'd guessed, was that men were already doing more than looking. They'd hoot, they'd whistle, they'd make sucking, smooching sounds when I was alone walking home from school and they were in their cars. One of my classmates, Tim Sather, seemed to have decided that his mission in life was to snap my bra strap as often as he could. And Mr. Traub, the gym teacher, would wrap his arms around me, letting his jogging-suited torso press briefly but firmly against my back as he helped me with my volleyball serve. That summer, I'd been wearing my swimsuit, a dark blue one-piece, and running through the sprinkler with the lorry kids, whom I'd been babysitting at the time, and I'd looked up to find Mr. Santos, who lived next door to the lorries, staring at me over the top of his fence with his mouth hanging open. A few weeks later, my older brother Greg had gotten in a fight at the town park swimming pool. When my mother had fussed over his black eye and swollen cheek, demanding to know who'd started it, Greg had muttered that the boys had been saying stuff about me. My mother hadn't asked him anything else, and I'd been embarrassed, unsure of how to behave. Did I thank Greg? Did I ask him what the boys had said if I'd done anything to provoke it? Finally, I decided to say nothing, to pretend the whole thing had never happened. That seemed like the smartest thing to do. The worst part wasn't the boys. It was the girls the ones who had once been my friends. She thinks she's so pretty, I'd heard Missy Henry sneer to Beth Brock one day at lunch after Matt Blom staring at me across the cafeteria had almost walked into a table. Like I'd asked him to stare. I had a mirror, and I'd seen enough magazines and TV shows to know that I was what was considered good-looking, maybe even beautiful. But the beautiful girls on TV or in those glossy pages all seemed happy. They never looked lonely, like their faces, their hair, their bodies were traps keeping them apart from everyone else. I couldn't figure out why I felt guilty when boys stared, like I was lying or offering them something I didn't really have. All I knew was that Missy and Beth and I had been brownies together. We trick-or-treated every October, giggling in the costumes that had turned us into cheerleaders or witches or pink ladies from Greece posing on Missy's front porch while her father struggled with his video camera. Now I was their enemy. Now they were on one side of a wall and I was on the other. So what am I supposed to do about it? I asked my dad. Back then, I thought he knew all the answers. Our house was full of books he'd read, biographies of presidents and scientists. Thick hardcover novels with approving quotes from the New Yorker on their backs. Different from my mother's mysteries, which were bright paperbacks with actual people on the covers and titles spelled out in foil. He'd patted my shoulder. Just be aware. Almost ten years later, whenever I felt a man's eyes passing over me, sometimes lightly like water, sometimes like the high whining of a mosquito in my ear, I'd remember my father mumbling into his tie, my father when he was still all right. Love you, sweetheart, he'd said, 
and hugged me, the way he hardly ever did since my breast had gotten bigger than bug bites on my chest.